What's going on everybody? It's your boy True Champion Steven and today we're talking about economics. But today let me get down to the nitty gritty here. We're going to be learning about secondary markets. And if you are like me and you're a competitive TCG player out there, then you've heard people complain about secondary markets before. However, I don't think you understand quite specifically what a secondary market actually is or why the prices are, way, are the way they are for the goods and services that they provide. So if you are like me and you're a competitively minded player and all you care about doing is updating your deck with the new cards that come out so that way you can properly have um, an updated deck for the format that, that you want to play in, then this video is going to be very important for you because it's going to teach you kind of why the cards you buy are the price the way they are. But this video isn't just for competitive card players, by the way. It's for anyone out there that deals with with the, with the secondary market. Um, so if you or someone you know, uh, like collects vintage pop figures or vintage airplanes or vintage video games, then you have to deal with secondary markets all the time. And many, many more exist out there. This video is going to be me teaching you guys what a secondary market is, how prices are defined, within it and maybe give you guys some tips and tricks about how you can deal with the many problems that a secondary market does have. Um, I know people complain all the time about market manipulation and how consumers just trying to buy out a bunch of cards and inflate the price and then sell it back out for a profit. Yeah, that stuff does happen, but that's not what we're going to deal about, talk about today uh, because that's more of an opinionated piece on like the problems or like the issues of a secondary market today. I'm just going to briefly touch on the issues of a secondary market, but I'm going to give you guys more information about how you can better understand on average how a secondary market acts and behaves so that way you can properly combat these potential manipulations in the future. Hopefully that all makes sense. Don't worry if nothing doesn't make sense. Feel free to always ask me a, a question down below. I will also be leaving timestamps to every section of this video as the, as the number one comment so that way you guys can jump back to any parts that you guys want to rewatch. No big deal. Also, feel free to hop into my Twitch channel. I go live on afternoons pretty much uh, PST pretty much every day this summer, so that's super awesome. Feel free to come ask me questions live and in person. I love talking about econ. I love talking about the things that you guys love, and I also just would really love to have you there in general, so come hang out. It should be a blast. Also, follow me on Instagram and Twitter so that way you guys can be updated on whenever I do go live just out of nowhere because um, that stuff does matter, or just follow me if you want to see some cute baby photos as well as all the antics that I'm up to day to day. But really quick, let's talk about what this video is going to be kind of about and like what's going to happen in it. So number one, I'm going to pretty much define what a secondary market is and how prices are defined within it, like I've already stated, but more in like a colloquial economic kind of sense. And then number two, I'm going to explain to you kind of the phenomena that exists within the minds of consumers that can also inflate the price or affect the price in the middle of a, of, of a given goods uh, life cycle. And then number three, I'm going to share with you guys some like one or two tips and tricks on how you at home can properly combat or even deal with uh, this price kind of problem in secondary markets or just a secondary market in general. Hopefully that all makes sense. And don't worry, I know what I'm talking about, you guys, because I'm a four-year economics student at the University of California, San Diego. I have run several different studies on consumer preferences, on consumer theory, in price speculation, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so I do know a little bit about what, what I'm talking about, but if any economics people out there want to help out and leave some helpful comments down below and help out the layman that might not understand all the intricate things that I might be getting into today, please feel free to do so or message me directly if you want to work on future videos because if this video series takes off, hopefully we can do more stuff like this in the future because I've always preached on my channel that I don't want to tell you guys what to think. I want to teach you how to think about the games and the things that you love so that way you can properly experience them or be the kind of player slash kind of collector slash whatever it is you want to be but do it the best way possible or the way that is most competitive or has an edge to it that's what i that's what i preach here that's how you can become your own true champion you know what i mean um without further ado let's go ahead and hop into what a secondary market actually is right now all right everyone let's talk about secondary markets so for starters, a secondary market is in the realm of what we're talking about for this video is the market for used goods or assets. Basically, if it crosses two different hands, it's a secondary market. If it goes from a distributor to a consumer to another consumer, boom, secondary market. Simple enough. Um, uh, let me give you guys like a little timeline here. You have the, uh, let's not use this, let's use this. Yeah. So, we'll, so we have the uh, main seller, the primary seller, we'll call it the PS. It goes to the primary distributor. That's the primary market. And 
then you have from the primary distributor to the primary consumer. This is technically a primary market as well, but it does actually act as a secondary market, but I'll explain more about that later. Um, and then it goes from here to a secondary consumer, and this is the real secondary market. So that's basically uh, the idea, is that you have this main item uh, that is unopened. Generally, it's just one kind of thing. You know, the seller here only sells one thing, goes to this seller, they again sell only the same thing, but then to somebody else, this seller can open it up. If it's a booster box, they could open it up if it's a really rare pop figure, or if it's like a randomized pop figure or a randomized collectible, or a vintage video game, they can play with it a little bit, and then they can sell it to somebody else. And this market right here, from the primary consumer to another consumer or to a secondary seller, which I should write it down as well, you have a secondary seller, SS for short, that too is a, a thing. And the funny thing is it can actually go back and forth. You can sell something back to somebody else or you can sell it to another consumer or to another consumer. That's the idea is that it just constantly changes hands with a bunch of people in the market. I'm not looking at the camera, I'm looking at my mirror <laughs> over here. But that's the idea. Hopefully you guys heard me when I say that. But the idea is that it just constantly goes between hands and the prices can go, it can be completely different from where it starts over here to where it starts over here because here it could be a booster box, but over here the same booster box gave you a card and that card is not what you're selling. So the idea is that the item is used, the item is open, the, the item was, was somewhere else before and that's what you're now selling. You're not selling the initial good, you're selling some secondary used good. That's where secondary market is. Now, why are prices priced the way they are in a secondary market? Well, normally you have prices, the way that they're set is they're set by uh, looking at average willingness to pay of the consumers within the market, and then they're priced by the sellers. The, that's called price-taking behavior. So the sellers define the price here. Say it's $1, right? And the reason why they're pricing it at $1 is because the average willingness to pay for the average consumer or all the consumers within their market is $1. And if they priced it at, say, $2, what they're doing is they have all these consumers right here that actually aren't willing to pay that much money for it. There's some of the consumers that will, that will pay that much money for it, but there's still a lot more that wouldn't pay it. And that's why they lose money, because they're not selling as much as they're making. And that's not good. Next up is if they priced it lower, like at $0.50, cents, for example, then they have a lot more consumers just buying it, and then they sell all of their, of their, of their supply. And what happens is they actually could have made a 50 cent more profit, for example, on each item they sold because all those same consumers would have been willing to still pay a dollar for it instead of just 50 cents. So that's how much profit they lost. So this is a loss of profit. This too is a loss of profit. Here at $1 is the most efficient outcome because it's the most amount of units they can sell at that best price because it's the most efficient outcome because every single average consumer would pay that dollar for that item and they would sell out at that time. And that's how much efficient profit they could make. That's how normal, or like in general, prices are defined and created in any in any market, by the way. That happens on almost any market. But what something very special happens within a secondary market is because there's so many sellers in a secondary market, you have what's known as arbitrage. And I'll write it like big, like big and red. Let me get rid of this here. Arbitrage. And basically, arbitrage is buy low, sell high. I'm sure you guys have heard that before. Um, so the idea is that you have two sellers. A seller selling at $1, which is the efficient price, and then a seller selling at $0.50, cents, the not efficient price, a lower price. I, a consumer in the secondary market, can see this, can know that these two sellers are doing these two things. I can buy every single one of these $0.50 cent of things and then sell them for $1 because now there's only two sellers in here they're both selling at a dollar, everyone will buy from me, and I make a 50 cent profit on each single item that I sell. Or even still, say there's no consumer, here's a seller, here's another seller, 50 cents, a dollar. This seller can just buy all these ones, and they'll sell them for two dollars, or sell them for one dollar. Um, they can sell them for two, for example, if they're the only person left in the market, or that given day. That generally doesn't happen as much as you might think, but they could still, they could at least sell them for a dollar, which is the efficient price, or the market price. The average price. <laughs> so many words, right? That all mean the same thing. Uh, $1. And now they make a 50 cent profit for each one they bought from the other person. Uh, and that's what arbitrage basically is, is that you can sell an item more than you paid for it. 
in a market. And that's not healthy. That's not efficient. That's not a good thing. It's not a sign of a very good market. In a primary market, for example, where the prices are perfectly competitive, you know, where supply equals demand, right? For example, if you know, if you, if you know your graphs, we well, you know this is supply, this is demand, I'm backwards, <laughs> lol. Uh, then uh, there's barriers to arbitrage. You know, there's qualifications to become a seller. There's qualifications to become a registered distributor, for example. Or there's even barriers to becoming a consumer. For example, the Pokemon Company International would not sell a case to a random dude off the street, you know? You couldn't do that. You'd have to come to them as like a registered distributor and they'll be like, or, or they'll contact you and they'll be like, hey, Target, can we sell you these things and you can pay for them? You know, that's that's that kind of perfect like market. You know, Target will not pay more or less for an item that they weren't willing to. Well, I guess they'd always pay less, but uh, the Pokemon Company International will not sell less. So hopefully that all makes sense, you guys, is that the idea is that a secondary market is any market that has a lot of people selling and buying and buying from sellers and sellers buying from consumers and consumers buying from other consumers. That's a secondary market. Whenever you have consumers buying from other consumers, that's generally the, oh yeah, I'm in a secondary market. So for all the people out there that aren't sure if this video is for them, if this kind of thing happens with the game or the event or the activity or the hobby that you like to do, then yes, you're in a secondary market. And then number two, the reason why secondary markets can have such fluctuating prices or can have such toxic communities or even can experience manipulation is because of this phenomenon of arbitrage, because the supply and the demand for these items constantly shifts and the prices shifts along, shifts along with, it, with it. And instead of the prices reacting to the demand and the supply, the supply and the demand is reacting to the prices. And that's scary. But well, prices are too fluid. In the secondary market, which is the ultimate problem. And now we're going to get into kind of what other things affect price besides just people being jerks and trying to sell cards for more than they bought them for. Because arbitrage doesn't necessarily affect price itself. It's more of a of a reason why uh, these price differences exist. Uh, by the way, if anyone out there is confused once again by anything that I'm saying, please feel free to ask a question down in the comments below. And if you guys want me to do more videos like this in the future, please, by all means, leave a comment or message me on Twitter and Instagram uh, about what you think might be a good idea. And uh, I'll maybe do it. Uh, but anyway, moving on to what else affects the price of items within the secondary market. All right, everyone, let's talk about some of the factors or principles that actually affect the price in the secondary market besides just arbitrage or general price taking behaviors from sellers and consumers. Here I have two phenomenon uh, that I think apply to almost every single secondary market, um, some more than others. And it's very important that when you guys are listening to me talk that I'll be using examples of trading card games because that's the community to which I experience the most secondary market uh, behavior slash know the most about. But if you're a collector uh, or a vintage baseball card collector or some competitive video gamer uh, for vintage games or speedrunners or stuff like that, or you're a vintage game hunter, all stuff like that, all these secondary markets, these same principles do apply just in different ways and it's up to you with the knowledge you have of the game that you play or the thing that you collect or the hobby that you do and what makes it both good or bad or what increases the demand for those items. It's up to you to kind of know what those things are. Here I'm going to be talking about two things that do apply to pretty much every single um, secondary market but I'm going to be using the realm of uh, trading cards to kind of collo colloquially explain it to all of you guys. Uh, and that's hype and results. Now these are not economic terms, um, but it is an easy way for me to kind of frame these phenomena for you people at home. So don't be discouraged if this doesn't directly apply to the uh, niche that you find yourself in for your secondary market, but I promise you it, it does. Just to like think about it like, oh yeah, this reminds me of this. And that's basically what I'm talking about. Hopefully you guys can do stuff like that. I believe in you. But anywho, we're talking about trading card games. So here we have two supply and demand graphs, the bread and butter of any economics uh, student. Um, and I'm gonna be using them to explain hype and results. Now, let me quickly define what hype is. Um, we all know about hype, but in the realm of what I'm talking about, hype is a sharp increase in demand for a given secondary good um, at the beginning of its life cycle slash at the end of its life cycle. Um, now, what's the, now, what's the, now, what's a life cycle? It's That's also not an economics term, but I'm going to use it as if it is one because it's an easier way for me to explain this phenomenon to you guys. Basically, the life cycle is when a good is first created slash distributed all the way until it is 
stop being created slash distributed. So for example, of a card, uh, say a booster set was being printed at a given date and released to the public. When it stops being printed is the end of its life cycle, and when it starts being printed is the beginning. I don't know why I told that backwards, but I did. Anywho, and that's, and like at those two points, the beginning and the end is where this kind of hype has the most precedent because it's what it's what's known as like a speculation of demand. Like you expect this thing to be really demanded at the beginning of its life cycle slash at the end of its life cycle or all throughout. It should keep like a consistent price from the beginning to the end because it has a constant just it, everyone loves it. For example, Jirachi from Team Up, Reshazard from Unbroken Bonds, uh, Shadowless Charizard, you know, for another example, that card's life cycle ended almost 20 years ago, and it still experiences hype to this day. If you can ever find a Shadowless Charizard for like under 300 bucks, people are going to buy that. You know what I'm saying? Kind of a, an example. Um, so let me talk about this a little bit. So what generally happens is, say, when Jirachi first releases, it's priced at $10. When this happens, people buy a lot of them, or the increase for the demand actually increases because they realize that they can get the card that they really want for cheap, for cheaper than they would have liked. So a lot of people buy it, and actually a lot of people buy a lot more than they maybe would have before because they realize that what, what they're doing is they're speculating. You know, they expect this card to go up. So what they're going to do is they're going to buy a lot more, and then eventually when the price goes up, they're going to sell off their extras and make some profit. That's what we call price speculation. Uh, this is kind of a toxic version of price speculation because, you know, it's kind of not cool just to buy more than you need just the way you can make a profit, you know? But it happens in so many different places in the world. It's just an accepted thing that we have to accept. So then, with all this hype, it causes actually an increase in the initial demand for Jirachis. And here is that effect. We'll call it D1. And it causes the price actually eventually to become, say, $15. And now these speculators, they understand that it takes time for markets to adjust. So they're still gonna buy at $10 because not every single seller in the market has adjusted to this new price. And then eventually, once all the prices have adjusted, they're gonna sell them for the new market price of 15 and make a quick buck. Uh, and that's basically how hype can affect the price. It causes a shift in the, in the demand while the, while the supply stays stagnant because the initial supply doesn't change. Like day one through week one, there's not going to be any more Jirachis in the market than there were before. And that's why you see this increase. And then something even crazier happens at the end of a card's life cycle. So say a card's life cycle has officially ended, no more are being printed, and then this same phenomenon of hype happens. So before you have the D1 effect, you have this static effect, say it's $10 by the end of its life cycle, for example, and then it jumps up again to this new 15. Well, now that there's no more Jirachis being made, you might be asking yourself, well, now we can't get any more Jirachis, so the supply actually goes down. And because the supply now changes to this new S1, we see another increase to some arbitrary value. It doesn't matter. Just make it X. X is still bigger than 15. And that's the point. And that's where we saw this crazy price of Jirachis at like $22 pretty much for like a really long time because there was so much hype for this card all throughout its life cycle, but a lot more happened for it at the very beginning. So it created a huge jump. The price kind of stayed stagnant until the very end of its life cycle. And then the cards aren't being printed anymore. So whatever the price it was at is now going to be the price it is forever because people are still going to want Jirachis for any, as long as they're in the format for standard, so they're just going to keep buying them, and then the supply will always get smaller and smaller. Thankfully, though, the price, like like the hype, is kind of died down to the point where this effect no longer keeps place. So now this demand effect goes down, but the supply effect still stays, and then we get kind of still an initially bigger price than the more um, competitive or efficient price, say of ten dollars. Now I talked a lot about price speculation there. But a real thing I wanted to point out here is that what really affected this price wasn't that the card was super broken or it was super hype. Yes, that is what kind of jump-started this effect in the minds of the consumers, but really what happened was people were changing their behavior. A lot of the times when you see a newer player looking at the card prices for stuff online, they'll, they'll look at a price increase and they'll immediately assume that it's because the card's good. So people must be buying it. That, not, that might not be true. What might be true is that the supply is actually really low for that card, so it has to be the price it is. Or the card is really rare, so it has to be the price it is. There's this idea that the more a card is, the more expensive it should be, and that's not how it works. The way it should work is, however many are there, whatever it's demanded for, that should be what affects the price. And that's where this effect of hype can really cause a problem in the minds of consumers if they don't properly understand it. And now we're going to talk about results.
All right, let's talk about results. So what results are in the frame of what I'm talking about is I already defined for you guys what a life cycle is and how hype is more of an initial reaction either at the beginning or the end. Well, results is more the, the, the term that I'm gonna use to, to describe what happens in the middle of a card's life cycle that can constantly shift it up and down versus this more stagnant effect over time unless proper action is taken to uh, increase the supply or if a demand decrease happens, uh, which generally speaking, doesn't happen for cards like Jirachi or Rush's Art, as we've clearly seen. So the way that um, I'm going to try and frame results for all you guys is that, again, it is a effect that happens in the middle of a card when it's already existing. And a common thing that can actually happen is that it happens just out of nowhere. Because say something happens that you guys didn't expect, like a, like a card does really well out of nowhere, like for example, Spirit Room Stunfisk, or for example, Picaram in a Broken Bonds format, you know. These are things that are unexpected um, because we, uh, or, or, or that can change the view of a card in the mind of the consumer. And as I've already kind of stated here, people think that because cards are expensive that they're good. Thus, it must be true that if cards are good, they should be expensive. Which means if cards perform really well, or decks perform really well, and certain cards in, in, the, in those decks are pricey or have a price, that means they're gonna go up. And that's why you see effects that happen similar to what happened with Zero Aura. So let's talk a little bit about the story of Zero Aura. So Zero Aura GX, I should say, uh, came out in Lost Thunder. And Lost Thunder was a set that a lot of people bought into because it was probably gonna be a new format set. There's a lot of great cards in it. Um, but you didn't actually buy the set or buy boxes because you wanted Zero Auras. You bought them because you wanted Alola Nine Tails, or because you wanted Blacephalon GX or because you wanted to pull Jump Plus or something stupid like that. That is why you bought Lost Thunder. And getting Zero Auras is really a byproduct. So we see at the beginning of its life cycle, it didn't have anything like this hype that you're seeing here. Instead, what it had actually was like an increase in the supply, which then caused the initial supply, which is this value right here, and the initial demand for it, which was whatever it was, it's like X value demanded, gave us this price of $5, which for a card that we think, I think we all could agree was good to be pretty cheap. So again, this is just more proof here that the idea that good cards should cost certain amounts of money just isn't true because what's really affecting this card's price is how many there are and how many people want, and that's it. So let's talk about more about what happened after this initial kind of price was decided. Peak Around became announced uh, a little bit before Zero Aura came out, and I don't know why there wasn't this idea of like, oh yeah, we're definitely gonna wanna pick these up for sure, but it's whatever. Eventually, Picaram officially came out, and because Picaram was officially coming out, people were starting to buy more and more Zero Auras, so the demand increased for Zero Auras. So let's go ahead and, top and write that down. D1. Let's say it increased slightly to like $8. By the way, this is for uh, non full art. Just like regular art, Zero Aura GX, by the way. So, this initial demand increase happens. But instead of this, so, so like instead of the initial kind of hype that we saw here where there wasn't really a supply effect at the beginning, there's actually a supply effect here because by the time that people started demanding Zero Auras, there wasn't really that, no one was opening Lost Thunder boxes anymore. So the Zero Aura number was stagnant. So when people started buying more, that means there was less Zero Auras in the market. So then you actually experience a little bit later in the market, this S1, this decrease in supply, which then caused another increase in the price. And then the regular art jumped to like $15 or something stupid. And the full arts were like 17 or 18, and then the pipe rares were like 25 or something stupid like that. Like right around the time Team Up came out. And then Pikaram went on to become the biggest tear in the world <laughs> in, in Team Up format. So it was killing the game. And then it just kept going this and this and this because more and more people were building Pikaram. And thus, Zero Aura started to increase the price because there was less and less and less. The demand for it either increased or stayed stagnant. It didn't really go up after that. The supply just kept going down because everyone was just buying them and buying them and buying them. So what you see, what, 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 what I'm trying to illustrate here is that, yeah, initially this card had no hype for it, but what actually changed it was the behavior of the consumers. Why did people wait so long to buy Zero Aura? Shocks me to this very day. It was clear to me that this card had value moving forward. And I bought like four of them for like five bucks. Best decision I ever made for, in my life, apparently. And then I sold them like the other day for like 20 bucks each. It was crazy. It was, it was honestly insane. So let's talk a little bit more about what's happening here. There's again, this thought that 
if you're being a price speculator, you're supposed to be evil and you're just going to buy as many as you can at $5 and then sell them back for 15. You know, price speculators don't need to be a bad thing. There is such a thing as good price speculation. And I'll explain more about that later on when we get into our tips and tricks on how to combat these kind of effects. But what I'm trying to get at you guys is that really what's affecting these prices or affecting the cards in your market isn't the cards themselves being good or bushy road or the secondary market being a jerk to you and just not giving you the prices that you want. It's it's you. It's the consumers and the way that we're behaving when cards officially come out or we get an initial price. The best way to shop for cards is when you see them on the day that they release. If that's a price that you're willing to pay, freaking buy it. There's no reason not to because it'll only go down or go up, which will make your investment even worse. So you may as well just do it right then and there and bite the bullet. If it's $10 like a Jirachi is, I promise you, that's the best price you might get on the day that it's released if it's a card that has this much hype. Or if it's a card like Zero Aura and it's $5, I definitely recommend you picking it up because that card is really good and it's just going to get better moving forward. I don't care if it's $5 right now. That does not mean that it's a bad card. So you guys can do, like, people are using the wrong tools to judge cards and judge prices for what they should like invest into. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a little bit. But the idea here isn't, oh, it's at this price. It must be good. No, the, the idea is, it's at this price, I wonder why, either way, I'm going to buy it. Now, let's talk about some of the tips and tricks that you guys can do to combat these types of price changing behaviors. A really quick aside here that I wanted to just to mention before we get into how you, the consumers, can kind of deal uh, with these effects and um, the kind of problems that, that are exhibited in a secondary market, I actually kind of want to talk about how companies like Pokemon or... Bushy Road or anyone that makes pop, whoever makes pop figures, I don't even know um, how they can kind of how they understand that these effects happen and how they kind of combat it. So let me talk about that really quick. So a thing that might happen is say Pokemon expects there to be a bunch of hype for a given card. Well, then what they'll do is whatever set that card comes out in, they're just gonna print more of it to where the initial supply which is this value here, is actually a lot bigger than people expected. So here's the expected supply, we'll call it SE. And then here's the actual supply that you get, we'll call it SA for actual supply. And so, because the demand for it was set at this value, say X and then five or whatever, it doesn't matter what the voice values are, what actually ends up happening is that at the initial price, the, the card actually is lowest. So that's another proof of like this phenomenon that I want to quickly get out there is that the best time to buy cards I promise you guys, is when they first come out. Because when they first come out, you know what the price is. You know what I mean? These things of, of them going up or down, you don't need to worry about it. So you can have a more satisfactory purchase. And we're going to get more into that in just a second. But I wanted to quickly brief kind of this idea that Pokemon know, like, like, like companies like Pokemon and Bushiroad know that their cards are in demand. And they know that the secondary market exists. They, 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 like, they don't just ignore it. And they do try to help out because to them, like... They may not care about the secondary market. It literally gives no money to them. They care about their consumers and they care about making sure that people are happy with their products. And a lot of the times, secondary markets are kind of toxic environments that people don't like. So if you ever notice that a car is actually really, really being printed, um, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe your maybe your company is performing something like this. Now, that is to say, companies do short print sometimes and make uh, this effect even bigger. That's also true. Um, but that's more of like, I don't think they do that on purpose. This, they would do on purpose. They would do it purposely so that way they could increase the initial supply of this really hype card that's coming out. Um, just wanted to quick make, make that quick a little aside right there because it, it is a thing that a lot of companies do. And I feel like it's important for you to understand that this could be an effect and another reason why a card is cheaper than maybe you thought it was going to be. All right, quick aside, moving on to the tips and tricks for you guys at home. All right, guys, that wraps it up for all the nitty gritty kind of theories that I wanted to get out of the way for you guys to understand. I tried to do my very best to explain everything to you guys uh, via colloquial terms or just kind of in general. And I tried my very best to apply everything that I talked about to the TCG world because that's the world that I understand the best. But right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some awesome price kind of behaviors that you can, that you as a consumer can practice if you want to try and combat this wild world of secondary markets and prices within secondary markets. Uh, there's two big tips and tricks I'm going to give you guys today. Number one is price speculation. We kind of already talked a little bit about it uh, when I talked about the hype and the results. 
and how they affect prices, but I'm going to get more in depth on what you can specifically do in order to kind of get a better idea of what prices are going to be in the future. And then the second one, this again isn't an economics term, but hopefully it makes sense to you, proper investment theory. Basically the best way that you as a consumer can get the best bang for your buck because believe it or not, a lot of people don't really think about their money correctly when it comes to um, secondary markets or even trading card games or hobbies that they do because they don't understand realistically what they're doing with their money. So I'm gonna talk about all that stuff right now. All right, tip number one, price speculation, the good and the bad, the bad people who try and predict prices and because they predict prices to go up or they see a price increase that isn't fully um, informed in the market yet, like not every single seller in the market is actually selling at that price. They're going to buy as many as they can that are cheaper and then sell them for the brand new price. And that's kind of not, the, that's kind of the bad. That's kind of the buyout kind of manipulation method that we've seen in secondary markets that nobody likes. But the good price speculation is people who like you or me just want to update their deck and get the best cards they can for the cheapest that they can. And they and, and, and they apply the same kind of price taking, price speculation behavior slash like experimenting slash thoughts. And they try and make an early guess as to what the cheapest point in time a card will have in its average life cycle. And that's when they're by the card. For example, the best time to buy Zero Auras was arguably when they first came out in Lost Thunder. I bought a playset for five bucks and I never looked back ever since. In fact, I actually made a little bit of money towards the end. It's actually super awesome. That's proper price speculation behavior. And now you're probably asking me, Steven, how can I do that? Oh, there's two easy ways to do it. First of all, in specifically the realm of trading card games, specifically Pokemon and Carpet Vanguard, the two games that I love the most, there's actually a Japanese market before there's an American market. And if you're good at, you know, using exchange rates and stuff, or you, you, you don't even really need to understand exchange rates, just know that 1,000 yen is cheaper than 10,000 yen. Easy enough. So what you would do is you would look at a Japanese website and you would try to look at a card's price on initial release, say Reshazard, for example, and you look at its price and you go, okay, that's its price then. And that's all you do. Then you wait like a couple weeks and see what the price is again. And then another couple weeks again and again and again. And what you're doing is you're looking at every single price point that Reshazard could be changing at in the market all throughout its lifespan until it gets to the point like a month or a week before it actually releases here in America. And then what you can do is you can look at those trends that the card followed throughout its life cycle and you can kind of estimate when the cheapest point it would be here in America. Because a lot of the times, while the Japanese meta isn't the best thing for us to copy here in Americans, here, here, as, here, as, here as American or English players, the Japanese market, however, is actually really good at kind of speculating what's going to be more expensive, what's going to raise in price, what's going to lower in price. So for example, if you saw that in the Japanese market, Zero Aura started off really cheap, and then eventually got more expensive as time went on, you would have known, oh, okay, so the best time to pick up Zero Auras, if I was buying singles, was just to buy it then and there on initial release. And that's what I'm talking about is good price speculation behavior using other data that you can get your hands on. Not enough people do that. A lot, a lot of people just go in blindly on day of release and say, how much is stuff? And then they're going to walk away dissatisfied. By doing this, you can actually set a more specific um, price that you're more willing to pay, or you'll be able to set the best price of that card within its life cycle um, throughout its life as a card, which is super awesome. And then another thing is uh, for say, Carpet Vanguard, exa for example, um, where the meta is actually very represent re representative of the cards that we're gonna play with here in English format. Um, like, like the meta in Japan is literally our meta just in the future. What you can do is you can go, oh, okay, so that card's gonna be really popular. Therefore, I know that everyone's gonna give that card a lot more hype when it gets over here in English. So what I should do is if I can find a good deal for it even earlier before it comes out, I'll invest in that. Or conversely, I'll invest in the deck that beats that deck and then just play that instead of playing the super hype deck. And that's actually super awesome to do as well. And the thing that I have done time and time again and has paid much dividends for me in the long run because if you invest early in the deck that is very good against the deck that's going to be super competitive and really popular, then eventually the deck that you're playing will actually get more expensive and the deck that you wanted to buy would actually get cheaper because too many people are buying it or not enough people are actually seeing the results that they want with it. So now they're gonna sell the cards back and then the supply will get back and then the price will drop and then boom, you can afford more of the cards. Super awesome. So those are really specific price speculation examples for trading card games, but I'm almost 100% positive that you could do something similar to this in a collectible or a kind of hobbyist world. So that's good price taking behavior that I think can help you guys save a little bit of money 
and get the best prices possible at the best times possible. All right, moving on to tip number two, proper investment theory. Now, here's what I want to nail into your brain. If there's one thing you get from this video, here it is. You are not a profit maximizing person. The stuff I told you about price speculation, that's all about getting the best deal possible, the cheapest card at the cheapest time. But realistically, that does not matter because the reason why arbitrage exists in secondary markets is because somebody will always pay that, at, that outrageous price that you set for your card. Like, that's the idea is we do not care about profits as competitive TCG players, as collectible, as, as collectors. We don't care. What we care about is owning the thing. All we want is the satisfaction that we get from owning the thing. That's called utility maximizing behavior. And proper investment theory is what I'm using to kind of explain to you guys that if you just understand what you're trying to do, you'll be able to have much more satisfactory purchases. So here's what I want you to do. Use, you, using the methods of price speculation with all the knowledge you, that you gained of secondary markets and how prices are defined, I want you to go before every time you go shopping for cards or singles or boxes or booster packs or baseball cards or pop figures, whatever you're going to do, before you look at the price of those cards, ask yourself, what am I willing to spend on this? How badly do I want it? What am I willing to get rid of? And set your own personal willingness to pay. A thing that I think I briefly mentioned to you guys was that if you set a willingness to pay for yourself and someone makes a price that's lower than that, you're gonna gain profit. That's called consumer surplus. That's what you want to happen. If someone has a price that's higher than your willingness to pay, then you're gonna get producer surplus, which is not what you want. That's when the, that, that's when the seller makes money off of you. But here's the thing, here's the thing that I feel like people don't understand is that if you properly apply the effects of hype, results, arbitrage, all that jazz into your mind when you make a price kind of ceiling for yourself, you're actually going to make a more accurate price. Like, you're like, like your price will be almost on the nose or a little bit over when you go shopping. And then when you make the purchase, you'll be more satisfied with said purchase. That's the biggest problem here. Isn't it, it isn't that I'm paying $20 for a Jirachi. It's that I didn't know I was going to have to pay $20 for a Jirachi. But if you have this idea that, oh yeah, it's pretty good. It's really hype. Therefore, people are probably wanting it. It's not the easiest thing to pull. It's a really good card. It's, it can go in a lot of decks. It's probably going to be like $15, $20, even though it is a hollow rare. You know what I'm saying? If you have that conversation with yourself and then you're willing and, and then you look at the price and you find out it's $10, you're going to be ecstatic. If it's going to be $25, you're going to be a little bit sad, but you're like, ah, I was willing to pay 20. How big of a deal is five, you know, more dollars than that. But if it's 20, you're going to be like, yeah, I got it. That's right. That's how much I'm willing to pay for it. Here's the money. Boom. You're more satisfied because when you're utility maximizing, what, what matters most is you being happy with your purchase. It doesn't matter that the purchase was outrageous. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand there's limits in income for a lot of people. And again, that's where this idea really helps because because if you apply your own restrictions, constraints such as income to your price speculation slash price kind of guessing or setting for yourself, you can also make a more accurate kind of purchase where you'll be like, okay, I think that the worst case scenario is if this card is $20 when it comes out. Therefore, for the next three weeks, I'm gonna save until I can afford to have that much money, right? You can now take action before the cards come out to get the income that you need to pay for the worst case scenario that you're picturing in your head. And if you're right, then that means you're good. And if you're really right and the card was actually a little bit cheaper than what you thought it was going to be, that means you have more money still. And you're moving forward and you're gonna have a lot more money to invest in later. That's proper investment theory, setting your willingness to pay in an accurate and well-informed way. And that's the biggest goal that I'm trying to do here for you guys is that you can now, with the tools that I've given you, set your own personal willingness to pay and go out in the world and buy the items that you want and say F you to the freaking secondary market system because you already have your cards and you don't need to spend the outrageous bought out prices now. So in summary, price speculation, make sure you're, make sure you're, you're a good price speculator and not a bad one, but I wouldn't blame you if you try to get a little bit of profit every now and then. Number two, Make sure that you understand that you're a utility maximizing person and not a profit maximizing person. You're already gonna lose money doing this hobby and playing these games. Just try and minimize your loss by properly speculating and defining your own willingness to pay. And the last thing, and I really, really want this to be clear here, is 
The secondary market is not the problem. It's how people behave within it. So now with the tools that I've given you in this video, hopefully you or someone you know can now properly get out there and buy the cards you need. If you're a parent, someone that's trying and you're, and you're trying your very darnest, and if you are a parent out there to a young Pokemon TCG player or a young collector of pop figures or action figures or vintage video games, whatever it is, if you're someone out there that is trying to help fund a dream or a love, then you too should watch this video because to you, you don't care about getting all the cards in the world and selling them off for a profit. You care about getting everything you need and that's it, right? And you shouldn't have to pay or suffer because of the problems in a secondary market. You should know what they are and know how to beat them. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please share it with people out there because too many people suffer or lose to the secondary market and all they need to do is properly understand it and understand what they can do as a consumer. And I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And don't worry if you're one of those awesome infinite income people out there who just buy cases on end and trying to flip it off a profit, your video is coming out soon. Uh, but if anyone out there is interested in more stuff like this in the future by me, whether it be economics or psychology of being a competitive trading card player or whatever it is, I'm very well diverse in a lot of different fields. Don't be afraid to ask if I could do a video on something that you might need down in the comments below. Please, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. This channel is growing more and more each and every day. I have huge, amazing plans for it, and hopefully you guys can come along for the ride. And again, if you have any personal questions for me or just want me to elaborate a little bit more on stuff, please come into my Twitch channel. Ask me live and in person. I love talking about econ. I love talking about the things that you guys love. And honestly, I would just love to have you guys in there. And I think it'd be super fun. And now, with all that being said, as always, I have been your true champion, Steven. Always remember to work hard, rest easy, and live well. And I'll see you all next time. Peace out.